Hey, everyone. How's everyone doing? Yeah. Last day, ready to leave, get home, burned out. Yeah, sleep, yeah. So um, my name's Greg Lockmiller. I work for NetApp. I'm a technical marketing engineer. I've been with them for nine years uh, in various roles from rack and stack storage, designing storage, putting applications on it, working in the emerging technologies and things like OpenStack. Um, part of my focus within NetApp, within OpenStack, is really just to, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, evangelize Manila, you know, share the information about Manila, uh, work with the development team and, and work with customers about what Manila does and what it can help, and as well as uh, actually digging into code and seeing what breaks or doesn't break. So. Uh, again, I'm, I'm Greg. Yeah, uh, I'm Thomas, uh, Thomas Lichtsch. I'm also working for NetApp. Uh, I'm a cloud architect based in EMEA. So, you know, today's session, Manila 101 and then use cases. Uh, we're going to go through a little bit about what Manila is, try to give you a basis, talk a little bit about that, talk about what's new in uh, Kilo for Manila, and then we'll get into some use cases. And we, if some of you were here earlier with Thomson Reuters, you heard a little bit about their use case. You might hear some repetitive information there. But uh, talk a little bit about where it fits in, what people are doing with it, what we see with customers, and, and how it helps solve problems. So uh, as we mentioned, we're also going to have a demo. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. So we'll have a demo of Manila, so you can see a little bit about uh, through uh, Horizon how it works and what can be done. Again, I'll, I'll talk about what Manila is, give a couple of brief slides there. We'll have a, uh, a demo, and then we'll We'll kind of get into you know why of the shared file systems and within OpenStack and what it does there. So, um, if you were here earlier, again, this is a this is a slide where, and I'll just kind of uh, give a little history. Uh, uh, two years ago, a little bit more than two years ago now, you know, there was uh, a group of people in the community that said, you know, a lot of a lot of customers want NFS, they want SIFs, they want that shared file systems in the cloud. And in two, this is really just to kind of iterate, in 2012, you know, there was a survey done by IDC that said, you know, look, there's 65% of the storage delivered and sold for all vendors, you know, and that was for shared file systems. And so there was a group within the community, like I said, that got together and proposed, made a proposal to the technical committee and said, hey, you know, how about a shared file system project within OpenStack? Um, they recognized a gap in both the technology being available as well as a, solving a business need. So, um, so that's kind of what started it all off. Uh, Manila is based out of or off of Cinder, so it gets its roots from Cinder. I think if you know Cinder pretty well, you could almost and certainly understand Manila. It's got a very similar architecture. It's got a same configuration type thing, uh, items with a manila.com versus cinder.com. And you'll hear about some terminology that is carried over from Cinder Changed the name a little bit, but the concept is the same. You know, just on another note here, just real quick, you can read those bullet items, but there was a, um, an annual report done by IBM that, you know, where they're predicting in the future about the number of applications and the percentage of applications being cloud-enabled, going to the cloud, and even moving uh, uh, those traditional applications that you wouldn't think that would be cloud-enabled, things like an SAP or databases, you know, th things that continue on as the maturity and stability of things like OpenStack get better, people are putting more of those type of apps in there. So just out of curiosity, how many people have NFS in their infrastructure today? Anyone? And from NFS, do you guys, uh, you, do you like NFS because of its ease of manageability? In other words, I don't, have to, I don't have to create a LUN, I don't have to carve up a LUN, I don't have to format the file system. I mean, I find personally, I was, uh, uh, in my career, used NFS quite a bit and found it very easy to say, okay, uh, I can share this file system between three or four bare metal or VMs. Uh, I used it for uh, cluster databases. That way I didn't have to worry about different types of application lock managers. I just let the NFS lock manager handle it. So I felt like NFS was pretty, uh, you know, pretty significant for certain applications as well as ease of management. So that, you know, that's some of the reasoning behind trying to bring NFS to the cloud. Um, and who has recently heard of uh, the AWS announcement? Do you guys know that AWS now offers an EFS? So we've had Manila for, in the community for two years, and uh, just recently AWS has come along and said, hey, we've got an elastic file system. So I think that adds credibility to the need of solving a you know, technical gap and a business need for 
even those folks that are within a, uh, the AWS space saying, I need to have that. And, and so again, within the private cloud or being a service provider using OpenStack, we, obviously you guys are here. You know, over the past two years, you've seen quite a bit of maturity and uh, improvement amongst it. And, and so you see a lot more inter enterprise type customers going to it and then bringing in NFS to it as, as well. So real quick, um, what is Manila? It's a multi-tenant secure, uh, <coughs> excuse me, shared file service. Uh, think of what Sender provides to block services. Manila provides for shared file services. So I can do NFS or SIFs. Uh, it does offer some security services. I can provide uh, uh, Kiberos or uh, you know, LDAP, things like that. So uh, you can provide lay a level of security. You can use it, again, for both NFS and SIFs. And it provides the shares to VMs or bare metal. And uh, as what Manila does is we'll provision a share. And a share can be based on your protocol, NFS or SIFs. And then you can allow access or deny access to that share. So I can say, for example, I create the share, and I may say, you know, Thomas, you can't have access to this share. So I can deny Thomas's host access. Or I can grant everyone in the room, and we can create one large clustered file system. We actually see that type of use case in universities and other in high performance compute spaces where they want to be able to have uh, you know, one file system, they drop everything in, they run their test, do the analytics, and, and leave it there. So, you know, just different types of use cases there and how people use it. But again, it's a multi tenant secure environment. Uh, it's a life cycle management of NFS shares. So I can create it, I grant access to it. Uh, I can create snapshots, and then I can say, okay, I'm done with it, let's delete it and break it down. And we're gonna talk a little bit later about the different types of deployment models, but uh, you know, one, of the, one of the first things, that, next thing I'd really like to uh, ask is if Thomas could show us a demo. You know, instead of just sitting here talking about it and getting death by PowerPoint like all week, you know, I'm, I'm gonna give a demo, or Thomas will give a demo of Manila, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, details of what's coming in Kilo, and then we'll get into the use cases. Bear with us while we swap here. Yeah. yeah thanks, uh, Greg. So um, <clears throat> we did a little recording here. Um, so this is a uh, familiar uh, Horizon dashboard, a lock-in. And um, Manila actually provides uh, an integration with Horizon, so it's very convenient to use. As you can see here, we, we currently don't have any shares um, deployed in our environment. So the first thing I would like to show you is, so there's a new uh, menu item and a new kind of overview of shares here. It's very similar and uh, reminiscent of uh, how volumes look like for Cinder. So let's see um, if we wanted to see how this looks like on a NetApp system for now. Um, I guess some of you are familiar with NetApp and the system manager. So this is a view on the uh, storage virtual machine. And as you can see, there are currently no so-called flex volumes deployed. So when we now go back to the OpenStack control plane and um, quite have a look at the uh, creation dialog for a new share, we can give it a name. I think that's very familiar. We can give it a size. And there's also uh, the possibility to actually <coughs> assign a share type uh, to, to a share. So in this case, uh, we have a default share type, and we also have a share type which is called SimProvision. You can give it any name, basically, but this should reflect what we kind of tried to achieve here. And I'll get to, get, get to that in a second. So the share is now to be deployed in the background. And um, if we have a look at the share type again, this is something that the cloud administrator uh, is able to define and to um, create. So I'm going to look in as the admin. And um, there's, again, the share types. And as you can see here, we have a default share type, as I said, and a sin provision share types. And there are um, so-called extra specs that you may be familiar with uh, from Cinder as well. So this, this allows you to unlock um, driver-specific um, capabilities. In this case, we have defined a share type called sin provision, and we enabled the sin provision flag for the flex volume on an adapt. So any other driver um, or any other vendor driver could potentially also expose different capabilities. Um, and you can actually reflect workloads, uh, types, or bronze, silver, <coughs> gold uh, types of services in this regard. So as I said, in the background, we created the share. So that's now available. 
um, as you can see here. Um, when we click on the share, we, um, like with Cinder, we see the details. And uh, one of the nice things here is that um, it has a UUID, obviously, like uh, almost any entity in OpenStack. And the share actually got created on the back end. So there's now a new flex volume, which has a share underscore prefix and the same UUID reflected. And it's also, as you can see, sim provisioned. Okay? So that got also transferred to the back end. Um, so the next thing we wanted to do is to mount this actually uh, in a virtual machine that we deployed earlier. So for that, we need to assign or allow the, this machine to access the share through NFS. So we would like to add the IP address of the client to the access rules list. So we do that. So as you can see, there's a, a drop-down menu item, and you can actually manage the access rules for that. So currently, that's empty. And as you can see here, we can add a new rule. So in this case, this will be IP-based. Uh, if you are deploying sys shares, you can also actually use the SID type to actually assign, allow users to access that. Um, there's also an access level, so that can be either read-only or read-write. And for now, we will use read-write, and then we add the IP address, add the rule. And we should now be actually to be able to mount this share from the client VM. So let's do that next. We will, in the details of that share, we will copy the mount location, log into the machine, and as you can see, this is uh, your typical mount, NF, uh, mount NFS command. We supply the export location and mount it to mount share. So let's CD into that and create a new file called hello world. So that's now sitting on the share. So what Manila also allows you to do is not only allows it to, you to create new shares, but there's also a nice feature called snapshots. So that's a point in time copy of a share. So let's do that next. So just like with Cinder where you can do a volume snapshot, we can do a share snapshot. Again, what this means that's driver specific in the case of NetApp, <coughs> what, what this translates to is that we do a flex volume, a snap, a volume, sorry, a NetApp snapshot of the volume. So that has an ID as well. And as you can see in the snap manager, once we refresh the view, at the bottom you see that there's now a new NetApp snapshot of that flex volume created. Again, the snapshot is created. And one of the nice, you know, next step that you can do is you can actually create a new share from a snapshot. So in a sense, this allows you to do clones of a share um, depending on that point in time copy. So as you may be aware, um, you know, if you want to do parallel testing, for instance, on um, where a database is involved and you need to um, go from a clean state, this would allow you to create <coughs> in parallel multiple environments that you could run your tests against. So let's do that next. Create a new share from that snapshot. We'll give it a name. <clears throat> so that share got created, and it's now, in a sense, a copy of what we created previously. To prove that point on the back end, this means, again, there's a new flex volume, which is actually a clone of that snapshot. So we would, to demonstrate that this is actually working, we will also allow the client to access that new clone or copied share. And um, we will remove the file that we created earlier from the original system, uh, sorry, from the original share. Uh, what does it actually mean if I allow a client to access a share? Uh, the export rules on the NetApp system will be uh, adopted. So that you can see here that the policies got, um, uh, got adjusted to what we entered in the OpenStack uh, in Horizon. So we again copy the mount location of that uh, news share mount that on the client as well. But 
first of all, we removed now the hello world from the original share and mount the snapshot or the share from the snapshot. And as you can see, the, that file is still there because obviously we, we snapshotted the previous state of the share. Um, and uh, this was kind of like a demo and I think it's quite easy to see how convenient it is to use from, from the Horizon dashboard and that is actually, you know, integrated very well in, in the standard workflows that you might have in your environment. And uh, I would like to in, invite Greg to, de to discuss a little bit more into detail how the architecture looks like. So we'll get back into the slideshow mode. Bear with us. So let's talk a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, talk a little bit about, um, you know, what Manila is. And again, uh, this may look quite familiar to you. Uh, Manila is, takes its roots from Cinder. So you have the Manila scheduler who decides, uh, okay, where do I want to place this uh, particular flex, I'm sorry, share? You know, is, it'll look at multiple backends. It'll uh, schedule those based initially on capacity or capabilities. And when I mentioned capabilities, Thomas talked about uh, extra specs and volume types. So you can, again, provide extra specs and, and share types and then if there's a capability that you require or a different type of uh, storage feature, then the scheduler will take care of that. And then obviously the API where uh, you can talk via REST API, RESTful API calls, Horizon, or you can do command line. Um, there has been uh, a couple of projects done where uh, groups have integrated to the Manila API uh, as well as from the Manila API service too. So, you know, some ways to integrate there. Pretty quick to do that too, actually, to be quite honest with you. Uh, no different than what Cinder and others that uses the, the RabbitMQ, uh, for example, here. And then uh, the Manila share process. And there's a, a Manila share process for each backend that you define. Uh, there's the management process and then a, a, a share process for each backend. So one of the things that you can do with your Manila backend, very similar to Cinder, is that uh, I can have multiple backends defined. Uh, they can be arranged to talk to the same or different storage arrays that you support behind it. I can have multi-drivers. I can have a NetApp driver, EMC driver, and a GlusterFS driver, for example, uh, defined in the three different backends. So it's not where I can only run Manila on one storage array or one vendor, but you can run it on multiple vendors. So it can fit whatever your infrastructure has and how you can support it, too. Um, and we're, I'll show you some of the vendors that are available here in the next slide. But again, so this is a very, uh, this looks very familiar if, you're, if you've seen Cinder and use Cinder quite a bit. And the configuration is much similar too. So uh, a couple of things real quick. So we've, these are some of the new drivers in the current driver set. And this is what came out with Kilo. I've kind of earmarked those that are in the stable Kilo release. Uh, initially, for the past couple of years, there's been a NetApp cluster data on tap driver a GlusterFS driver, as well as an EMC, Isilon, and VNX driver. And then just recently, that there has been, uh, within the master branch and some of the split branches, you know, the other drivers, but now within Kilo, these drivers are available. So if you went to GitHub, wanted to see what was there in the master Kilo branch, um, yeah, Matt, the Kilo stable branch, you could see that these particular vendors have now provided drivers for Manila. So we think that, uh, again, you know, kind of out of, you know, trying to promote Manila that other people have seen the need for it to solve a business as well as technical gap. So you got the other drivers there. You know, I won't go through them. You guys can see them. Just uh, real quick, the HDFS one is for Hadoop, to just share that with you. So let's talk a little bit about um, some things that are new with Manila. Uh, I won't, again, I'll go over two or three of them. I won't read these. These are some of the, the bigger things, at least from a, a NetApp perspective, some of the things that we've been doing and working with. Uh, I'll share with you guys a, a brief discussion about deployment models of Manila that was community driven and the network plugins that are available now. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, the storage service catalog. Uh, we do have heat plugin, which is it's not quite upstream, so you can get a heat plugin and maybe you want to you know, deploy a stack and maybe I need 10 Manila shares, eight sender volumes, and you know, two or three VMs, things like that. Um, a couple of things that's going on in the future that's not in Kilo, just to share with you, um, you know, some of the future pieces of Manila as a community-driven project is uh, replication with Man within Manila, as in uh, share mount automation. So one could be able to define how shares could get automatically mounted within your VM. Today, that's not possible. Um, again, it's uh, you know, just the, the progression of what the project's doing and how things are moving forward. So 
One of the things we'll talk about here next is along the Kilo release is uh, deployment models. So there's a couple of different deployment models, and I'll be brief here. I can do a single SVM or multi SVM, and, and so you're probably saying, okay, great, what's that really mean? Well, the earlier releases of Manila from IceHouse 4 would say, uh, I as a, a share in a Manila deployer would create what they call an SVM. It's effectively, I'm going to go create an NFS server. And it would build up that NFS server and break it down based on the shared network, and it was integrated with Neutron. So if you went to a Juno or IceHouse release of Manila, that's what you would get. You would have what we call the multi-SVM model, where when I went to create a share, it's going to build that uh, NFS uh, server for you. Now, with what we're saying is it's going to manage that SVM uh, creation breakdown in, in the SVM management, right? Uh, single SVM is a new feature with Kilo, where the idea is to simplify the deployment, make it a little easier for those that might want to do a, a demo or just put it on a dev stack, deploy it with on their laptop with Vagrant and things like that. So you can have a single SVM, and what we're saying there is have a pre-configured NFS server. Maybe it's a storage virtual machine for NetApp, or maybe it's the reference implementation that comes with Manila and it creates the uh, NFS server for you. So, and what we mean there is that'll be configured within your manila.conf, it won't manage or create or break down those NFS servers when you run Manila in the single SVM mode. So those are the, that's a couple of things that are new with uh, Manila in the Kilo release. The other things that are new that are quite significant are the different plugins for network. Like I mentioned earlier, the network plugins initially with Manila, it was the Neutron plugin. You know, great, I've got an ML2 agent. I'm going to also have a layer three and be, have that integration to Neutron. And we found, uh, both in the community and as well as at NetApp, that not all customers wanted to have Neutron. They didn't want to have to have, you know, build out all of the uh, Layer 2 activity. Now, don't get me wrong, most people have uh, VLAN tagging and everything in their network anyway, but from, uh, you know, being able to deploy it easily or don't want to change their architecture or their infrastructure. So uh, the community got together and said, well, <clears throat> they built, they allowed network, uh, network plugins for the Nova network plugin. We heard where people still wanted to use the Nova net type activity. And then finally, the standalone plugin too. So I can uh, have a flat network standalone plug network plugin for Manila to use and not worry about Neutron. And, it, and with each of these methods, you can, you know, for example, with Neutron, Neutron's got to define networks, the IPs and things like that, how it's been built and how the layer two connectivity and, and uh, packets are designed. But you can also, what happens is with Manila, Manila would go grab network information from Neutron. You'd have to define that. In other words, I would tell Manila, hey, Manila, create a share network, and you're going to use the Neutron net and Neutron subnet. And then that's how Manila would build network connectivity for the storage virtual machine on the back end. So if I, if I were in the multi-SVM with Neutron, I would create, let's see if this works. Here we go. I would create an SVM within my storage, and I would use... Uh, Neutron information for IP addressing and, and the segmentation ID. So now with uh, Kilo, we've taken that, still have that, but taken it the next step further where you can use standalone plugins and define some network elements that way or use Nova networking. So th those are some of the changes that's been uh, driven into Kilo. Been a lot of work by the community within the Manila team and the core team there. The other thing that um, I'll, I'll talk about is Thomas gave a demonstration of the, uh, the share types. And, and this is somewhat like a storage service catalog that you can get with, uh, with Cinder and use of extra specs. And with the uh, uh, volume types in Cinder, we have extra specs for the NetApp driver, and then you can create share types. Uh, obviously, share types are most certainly not just NetApp driven, but what we're trying to share with you here is the ability to surface up NetApp technology uh, through the abstraction of Manila and have different ways of provisioning shares that maybe your architectures or your standards define or that they require too for your tenants. Um, the share types, you know, just an example here, you're gonna have database or analytic type share types, archival, maybe, maybe you have, like I mentioned earlier, maybe you have a bunch of different backends and as long as there's a driver, you can define a share type for a specific backend and so for like an archival share type, maybe that's the cheap and steep, you know, the cheap and deep storage, right? You know, it's something that is, uh, you, know, you know, very large footprint, very cheap. It can be whatever, we, if there's a driver for it, then you can define that back in and use that driver. 
or you can use things for like database. I mentioned earlier about, you know, we're starting to see more uh, traditional applications go into the cloud. And so uh, a lot of guys that I work with and customers that I work with like to have NFS for their databases for manageability, quick backups, quick recovery, uh, persistent file systems and things like that. So then you can use, uh, maybe define your backend there to use maybe a higher end backend back, or a storage array as the backend too. Things like that. So, it, you know, it's, it's the storage service catalog is meant to help uh, you as a cloud administrator and the storage administrator uh, provide options to the tenants or maybe isolate a tenant to go down a certain path so he doesn't interfere with other things too. So, um, one of the things, again, we all think about the cloud and OpenStack and the control plane, and it's about being enablement, right? Self-enablement, and, and Manila's no, no different there. It is an enablement of the end users and being able to provide that self-service. And those that heard earlier sessions, um, you know, you empower those end users. You allow them to take care of their business and not wait on IT processes, for example. I can still limit and not create runaway uh, tenants for I can give them quotas. Uh, you can define access rules for them as well. You know the space quota, number of snapshots, number of shares quotas, things like that. So you can really tie some things down to the tenants too. I can make the share types that we just spoke about be um, public for everyone, or maybe per private per tenant. Or maybe I can share them, you know, for a couple of tenants, things like that. Um, I mentioned earlier too about integration and you know, REST API integration if you already have an automation infrastructure or some sense of configuration management infrastructure, you can uh, work with the APIs and integrate with the APIs as well. So um, I think there's lots of different advantages in, in why you bring shared file services into um, you know, the private cloud or being a service provider using OpenStack. You know, one of the things too that I'll mention later you know, uh, we're also working to bring Manila into dis distributions and granted right now we're only a, a, what used to be an incubated type terminology and tag and that's changing, but Manila will be a, a, um, released in Liberty, you know, that's the expectations. They'll get picked up by other vendors by uh, like the Red Hats or the Susies or the Mirantis and the things like that. But we're already working with those guys so they can generate RPM. So if you want to go to a, uh, an OSP or a SUSE cloud, you, know, you can have those uh, RPMs for a kilo version of Manila to work with too. But you know, we've talked about different things. We're getting ready to get in use cases, we've talked about what Manila is and how you can use it. But one of the things that I'd like to, Thomas to share with us is he worked with quite a few customers in Europe and, and so he's got a, a nice perspective about uh, you know, you know, what, what's different about Manila. Why is that different than object storage or why is that different than block storage? And you know, have Thomas share with us a, a little bit about what he's got there. Yeah, sure, Greg. So, so one of our largest customers that I will talk about in the next slide actually came to us and um, they saw that they could use block storage, obviously, in, uh, in OpenStack. They could also use object storage today in OpenStack and they ha use both for certain applications. But one, they were missing one thing, um, shared file service for that matter. And the reason behind that is that uh, block storage, it's, uh, you know, it's very kind of like a low level, obviously. Uh, it's very fast from a latency perspective. Uh, object storage, on the other hand, is um, you know, very high level. You can use metadata association, but it's has, it lacks usually in terms of latency. Um, both obviously have valued use cases and benefits, but also some drawbacks. And shared file services or shared file systems seem to be kind of like the middle ground where you have a, you know, you actually trade a latency for manageability. And um, so this customer um, is actually, if I can. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Excuse me. So this customer is actually Deutsche Telekom who have a use case for shared file services in the cloud. And we did an evaluation of Manila with them in the last release. So um, the key idea here is that they run um, an email service that they want to onboard potentially in OpenStack. And the thing is that um, if you consider the subject and the mail body, that is something that customers want to have access to in a very snappy manner, whereas there's a, you know, some tolerance towards uh, the attachments. Those can be fetched with a reduced latency. So the key idea here is to use shared file services, NFS, uh, NFS backends for that matter, to store the email, the index, and the subject um, and the body of that mail to be quickly fetched. Um, if you are interested in this specific evaluation where we looked into the, uh, 
uh, applicability of Manila for shared file services. Um, this talk f uh, was taking place yesterday and it's already on YouTube and uh, you can check, check it out and see how a customer, from a customer endpoint or view this, uh, they see that. Um, one of the other use cases would potentially be um, you know, making use of the uh, snapshotting and creating a new sh share from snapshots capability to use that for parallel testing. Um, one, w in another session, uh, I think two days ago here, someone, uh, someone from the community demonstrated how he was using Manila together with Heat and Trove to actually spun up new databases which were backed by shared file services or NFS backends. Um, this is one of the, uh, conceptually, you could use this for continuous integration in a very um, beneficial manner. Um, if you consider tests uh, which may be dependent on a certain database state, uh, what you usually traditionally end up with is that you run a test on a certain state of a database that usually changes the database in, in a certain manner. And then, you, you know, once the test is successful, you actually reset the database and then you run the next step, uh, next test. So this is kind of like a sequential test. And if you have a very large test suite, this can take up, you know, can arbitrarily long. So from minutes to maybe hours or whatever have you. So what if we could now create, let's say, 10 similar shares of the database, uh, use Trove to actually spun up 10 versions of the database simultaneously and run all of our tests in parallel. Um, so this is something where you could potentially use Miller f uh, through the API benefits. Um, combine that with Docker, which would be a very lightweight. So this is one of the ideas where you could use this for continuous integration. Um, I will have uh, Greg to talk about a few more okay. use cases. Thanks, Thomas. So, um, there we go. Sorry. So we've um, you know heard a little bit about what Thomas has seen with customers and the use cases with Dutch Telecom and continuous integration, and that flows in well with some other use cases too, where people would use continuous integration and advance that and say, well, I need a NAS as a service. Uh, we already know of a couple of people, a couple of customers wanting to do NAS as a service. One of them is actually using Manila. They were here earlier today to speak about that. So think about um, if you as a developer or you as a, you know, um, a deployer and say, well, I need, I need three or four file systems. And the time it takes traditionally, and, it's, and I'm not paraphrasing this for every customer, but the time it takes to get that done uh, versus being able to do it self-provision. So you're able to do it yourself versus having, you know, waiting on the traditional IT process. So again, you know, we heard earlier today about a customer that wanted to bring in that, that whole IT provisioning process for NFS into the customer. You know, be self-service, be quicker to market, being able to develop uh, software faster, be able to bring applications to bear faster, you know, quicker to market. So I'm not going to read through all these, but I think you could see some of the benefits of what we do today with OpenStack, what you can do with Open, uh, Cinder or Nova. You know, you know, great, I can give a Nova commute compute layer pretty quick to so when they get the VM, now you can provide them with some shared file services or a clustered file system as well, just like you can with Cinder. So uh, again, it's that flexibility that speed the market uh, and, and providing those tenants and those uh, project users, you know, the ability to secure that too. So again, we talked about Neutron, so you can have that uh, Neutron subnet just for that tenant, or you can have a storage network that everyone uses. So lots of different opportunities for improvement and how they can be self-served uh, self and self-management too. So again, the NAS as a service uh, used in many different ways as well as the complete life cycle of that share too. I create it, I use it, uh, and I can destroy it. So it's the complete life cycle there just like anything else. I think one of the things I'd like to point out too is that I keep hearing from some customers and people here is the integration with Hadoop. So there is the, you know, the Hadoop FS. Um, a lot of times we hear people that say, well, I, you know, I need Hadoop within the, uh, w you know, within the OpenStack. So you can also use uh, the Hadoop FS driver with Manila and support that as well. Too. So again, extending those traditional IT servers back into your private cloud or as a service provider, you can build SLAs and provide NAS as a service too. And we think that's you know, added credibility. Again, I mentioned it once already is that um, there's a lot of different, uh, in the community, a lot of different companies coming together as the core team 
uh, those who used to be competitors are now collaborators within Manila. And we also obviously see that when AWS came out and said, great, you know, I can give you an elastic file service too, where you know, OpenStax had it for almost two years. Um, another use case that um, is the integration with Manila. Uh, how many people have deployments or environments where maybe they write uh, REST API integration into Cinder or Nova or Neutron? Anyone do any of the Python development work to integrate? A couple, okay. So again, we found just with the Manila API being very similar, and if not almost exactly like uh, Cinder, that it makes it quite easier to integrate with. So in a couple of examples, and I'll, I'll talk about a couple of things here that one's prototype and really just coming off the ground. Um, how many people are familiar with SAP? And anybody use SAP's LVM by chance, the Landscape Virtualization Manager? So that's a tool that allows one to build uh, you know, clone up and build workflows for SAP environments. And those that know about SAP, large scale applications, databases, file systems. And so we've done a proof of concept with a prototype that says allows uh, SAP's LVM tool to communicate to Manila and take and transfer, you know, the commands from SAP's LVM to say, oh, you need a share or you need to create a clone. So it would create a snapshot, create a share from snapshot in Manila's terminology and then present that back up to SAP so they can complete within workflows and integrate some of the SAP LVM workflows. That's just one example. You know, earlier today we talked about the integration to NetApp's uh, workflow automation. Uh, and then I spoke earlier today, there's a group that's got a, uh, a, a, home, a homegrown Python configuration management tool where they've, they work with Ironic. So they'll talk to Ironic for bare metal and they've done some API integration there and now they want to talk to Manila as well possibly. So, you know, a lot of different potentials, but the point we're making here is it's got the API, it's REST API like anything else in OpenStack, and it's, it's actually quite easy to work with. And then, um, I guess finally, uh, Thomas spoke to it quite a bit, but database as a service, and it can be application as a service. You know, just think about if I want to be able to quickly spin up applications, provide file uh, shares and file systems, you know, being able to quickly provide that, clone that. So when I say clone that, think about what Cinder does. I can, with Cinder, and you saw in the demo, I can do a, a Manila create share, Manila create snapshot, and then I can create a share from snapshot. So think about the use cases are kind of more so outside the box than a lot of people are accustomed to, and that I can make a known point <coughs> or valid data, go through use cases, hit a milestone, maybe something breaks, maybe I've got to re redo it. So I'll come back to that known point with my Manila shares created from snapshot and things like that. So I've, I've preserved my data, I've done a test, and then you can come back and use that data as well. So that can be an application, it can be just file systems, it can be a database, or it can be a large scale application too. So just you know, another piece of things that you can do and really you know, trying to give you the, you know, the art of the you know, empowerment, right? Be able to empower your end users to take care of a lot of work and not necessarily be dependent upon an IT group or you as a developer or you as a deployer being more capable of you know, providing different levels of SLAs for your customers too. So these are some of the things that, you know, that we could talk all day about different use cases and what happens and how customers are using it. But just like anything else in OpenStack and within the cloud, it's all about trying to enablement, be quicker and be more efficient too. So then finally, you know, a little summary about what we've done here today. And hopefully, you know, you've got a little bit of uh, what we've spoke of today. You know, the key, a little bit about the key concepts of what Manila Project was. It's about, you know, shared file systems, being able to allow self-management uh, of those. Uh, you know, great, I can do NFS and SIFS protocol within a cloud now. And hopefully that helps solve some of the problems that your business units or you as a, you know, an IT person needs to solve or a developer needs to solve. And one of the things we didn't get into a whole lot, but it is multi-tenant. I can use Neutron to provide, uh, you know, tenant level networking. I don't have to share that. So if there's so security or isolation that you need, you have that capability with uh, Manila as well. We talked about the use cases, you know, DevOps, uh, customers using it for NAS as a service. Think about database as a service for applications or a file system as a service, whatever the case may be. And then share lifecycle management. You heard Thomas talk a little bit about you know, the, the DevOps and testing and coming back to a known point and a good point or restoring back to another point in time. But I think one of the things that, you know, sharing with you here is also the benef benefits of Vanilla. You know, maybe for those that have uh, the ability to say, 
I need to do things quicker, bigger, and faster with my customers, and your customers could be your business units. Those customers could be true customers that, away from your company, but empower those guys to take care of you know, being able to use file systems. One of the things that I heard earlier was that uh, if you heard Justin Detman talk, you know, the, you know, the one point that he made out is that you know, his business units are his customers, and they were used to file systems. They knew how to mount it. They knew how to have a persistent file system storage. They were able to you know, use that to their advantage. And if a system crashed, they didn't have to worry about recovery because of NFS and SIFS being a, a persistent file system. So those are some of the things that we hope we kind of shared with you, kind of stir the thought process. Uh, we're not going to be able to give you the whole nine yards about what Manila is in, in a short period of time. But, you know, in, instead of death by PowerPoint, we wanted to give you a demo too to kind of help uh, see how it works and what it's about. You know, it's always good to be able to associate some true activity around it versus just hearing about it from PowerPoint. And then finally, some resources here. So my understanding is that these slides will be available with, as attendees here. And uh, you, know, you could probably say within 30 minutes, the uh, video of this session is going to be posted on YouTube as well. But there are some, within a NetApp perspective, uh, we've got some blogs around OpenStack and Manila. Uh, one of the things, if you wanted to get started with Manila, is to use the Deployment and Operations Guide. So if you did, went out and just did a Google, you know, OpenStack Deployment Operations Guide NetApp, it'll tell you a little bit about our driver and how to configure that, as well as Cinder and some other things, too. Uh, we do have a couple of technical reports, um, you know, HA deployments uh, using NetApp storage, uh, uh, OSP5 on NetApp storage. We actually have a SUSE cloud uh, reference architecture that just came out. And uh, just uh, two days ago, uh, we put out a technical report or a white paper around the use of, uh, uh, or that's it, uh, uh, SUSE Cloud 5, I'm sorry. But two days ago, we have a, a, a technical report about running SAP within OpenStack with Manila as well, and with some of the integration I spoke of earlier. So um, you know, a couple other resources there. We had a couple other sessions here. So you can go to the YouTube channel, search for Manila. There'll be more than just ours here. Thomas mentioned one earlier. Where so when did the, you know, the Trove, the uh, Heat, and Manila, and be on the lookout for more around that and, and maybe building app catalog around that. Just think about you know, some of the application catalog and container things that are going on now and building those type of application and service catalogs and bringing together more and more projects to make things like that work. So uh, it is the last day. We do have a booth downstairs, but uh, please take the moment and, and run by there if you need any other information or details. And then finally, do you guys have any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, please, please use the mic. Please. Yeah, if you could, please. Could you stand up and use the mic? It helps for the audio. I just want to explore the, snap, the snapshot feature a little bit. Uh, I know with the NetApp, you, you can lock the, blo the, the blocks for the snapshot. Is that what actually happens when you do a snapshot? Yeah, so Miller using NetApp as a back end? Yeah, so if you have NetApp as a back end and you're using the NetApp driver, it's going to leverage the NetApp snapshot technology as well as FlexClone technology. And then uh, just to take it one more step, if I do a, a, a Manila create share and I use the NetApp backend, it creates a NetApp flex file. So obviously when I do a snapshot, um, it, it's a point, it can be used for point in time and it also, I'm usually worried about protection. So if I had replication on the backend with NetApp already, yep. um, would it then automatically be replicated and get my protection too? So uh, right now, that's one of the extra specs that we want to uh, implement. Let me ask for Clinton, is the uh, snap mirror extra spec? That's not ready yet, is it? In, in Liberty, so in Liberty, you'll have the ability to say, here's an extra spec to define uh, data protection. And so it would find a, it would create uh, a flex file or a share and then have a, a snap mirror relationship. So uh, you know, that's kind of where that is right now. Any other questions? Very good. So, you know, thanks for your time. I know you guys had lots of choices in the, in the session catalog, and we do appreciate you all coming by and spending you know, a few minutes with us to hear about Manila.